Happy New Year! It's the start of 2021. People are hoping this one turns out better than the last one. And if you're in the electric vehicle space, there's quite a lot to be excited about. We just came out of the holidays with what I think was the funniest, well thought out EV ad I've ever seen. I'm talking about the one featuring the Griswold family from the National Lampoon film series. And then there are new cars on the way later this year, with Chinese-owned MG and Xpeng both set to reveal new production electric cars in the next week or so. We saw Tesla finish the year strong, managing to produce more than half a million cars last year and deliver a sliver under half a million. And Tesla's late December addition to the S&P 500, news of a new battery deal with Panasonic and a valuation for the company of more than $700 billion is certainly not something we should sniff at. But amidst this, there's a single, slightly less happy piece of news concerning Tesla. Claims from multiple news sites and from various social media networks that suggest some owners of Tesla Model 3 and Tesla Model Y electric cars are finding that their vehicles are not providing adequate heating when it's super cold outside. As Electrex Fred Lambert detailed in an article a few days ago, one which I personally think was particularly clickbaity in its title, some Model 3 and Model Y owners are reporting that the heating in their brand new Teslas are failing to properly function when the mercury plummets. This issue, according to Fred, is particularly problematic in the Canadian province of Quebec, where he quotes one owner with a problem and states that the local service centres are pretty busy trying to deal with the issue. He also cites social media groups in the region as reporting similar issues among a wider Tesla owner base. The reasons for these failures are currently unknown, and frankly, any speculation as to the reason of the failures are a bit of a moot point right now. That said, it is entirely right and fair to highlight this problem, the full scope of which is still unknown, and to report on it. And were it any other automaker, I hope the entire automotive press would give it the same kind of attention as Tesla is attracting right now, because frankly, it's not okay when a new car or component within a car comes to market and is plagued by problems. I am sure Tesla is working to address this issue, and since we don't know if it's a hardware failure or a software issue, it's pretty difficult to try and figure out when this will be solved. We can hope that the fix will be swift and that it will be an easy one for owners to go through. After all, if it's well below freezing outside, which is where Quebec sits for a large part of the winter, you don't want to drive a car with no heating. And frankly, it's dangerous to do so because outside visibility requires you to have decent in-car heating to clear all of the glass in your vehicle. But instead of trying to second guess Tesla here or be accused of either playing down the story or hyping it up, I've decided to use it instead as a jumping point to discuss the differences between the three main types of heating currently used in modern electric vehicles. We have resistive heating, PTC or positive temperature coefficient heating, and heat pumps. I'm also going to try and explain why Tesla may be having issues with its new Model 3 and Model Y heating systems. Essentially, they've just switched to heat pumps. And ask if there is a solution to all of these not quite perfect heating options. Why bother with explanations, I hear you ask? Heat is heat is heat. Well, yes and no. How heat is generated or transferred is important. The type of heating system your electric car uses can have a significant impact on how the car performs in winter, and it might sway which type of heating you're looking for if you're in the market for a new car. Let's talk first about resistive heating. Resistive heating employs pretty much the same techniques as those portable electric bar heaters that you can just plug into a wall outlet. At their heart, you'll find a heater element which consists of a series of high resistance wires which are generally connected to some kind of control mechanism. When placed in an electrical circuit and current applied, the wires heat up, turning most of the electricity that passes through them into heat energy. A series of fans within the heater system then draw air over those wires, which then heats the hot air up, and then you blow that hot air around the cabin as required. 
A variation on this, which is often preferred by mainstream automakers as it allows them to use standardized heating and ventilation parts, places the resistive elements that heat up inside a small closed loop liquid heating system with a traditional heater matrix placed inside the cabin. Unlike a conventional internal combustion engine heating system where a thermostat connects the car's heater matrix to the car's engine cooling system, which uses waste heat from the engine to warm the cabin in the winter, this immersive resistive setup places a small electrical heating element inside the cooling loop of the heating system. When that heating element turns on, instead of heating up the air around it, it heats up the coolant in the car's heating and cooling system, just like an electric kettle boiling water. That warmed coolant is then pumped around the heating system and through a traditional heater matrix inside the cabin. As air is drawn over the matrix fins by a series of fans in the cabin, the air is heated by the warmth of the heater matrix and the coolant inside it. And thus you get a nice, warm, toasty cabin. The first type of resistive heating is almost instantaneous and if the variation on it is properly specced, it can also heat things up pretty quickly. But while they are cost effective to build and reasonably robust in their operation, Resistive heating is anything but energy efficient. Heating the cabin using a resistive system requires all of the heat energy you need to come from the resistive elements. And the colder it is outside, the harder the heating system has to work to keep the cabin toasty. Most modern electric cars' resistive heating setups use between two and three kilowatts in winter weather to keep the cabin warm. On a one hour drive, that's two or three kilowatts of electricity from the battery that you can't use to move the car along. And if it's super cold outside, the energy drain is a lot worse. It's one of the reasons, for example, that cars like the Chevrolet Bolt have a far lower range in winter than they do in summer, since it uses a resistive heating system and a conventional air compressor for the air conditioning in the summer. Next up, we have positive temperature coefficient or PTC heaters. These are pretty clever. Tesla's used them in the past, and they're either made with conductive ink containing carbon or silicon compounds printed onto thin polymer substrates, or they're made by chemically etching circuits onto an existing sheet of thin metal. Capable of heating up pretty quickly, these heating systems operate a little like resistive heaters, but the difference is that they don't require complicated external thermostats to control their heat. They can't easily overheat, and are far more energy efficient and stable in their operation. PTC heaters are built with special components whose ability to conduct electricity changes according to their actual temperature. When they are at a low temperature, electricity can pass reasonably easy through the circuits, and the flow of current through the PTC heater generates heat, which then quickly warms up those elements and whatever they're attached to. But as the temperature of the PTC element increases, the resistance also increases, which reduces current flow and thus lowers the system's power consumption. PTC heaters are more energy efficient than old school resistive heaters, and they can operate in a large range of temperatures, as well as being designed and built to reach a variety of different temperatures. But they are not the most efficient heating system out there, as they still have to turn electrical energy into heat energy, a process that will always lose energy somewhere in the system, which is where heat pumps come in. Heat pumps in cars operate exactly like miniature versions of the heat pumps that many of you will have on your homes as part of the mini split air conditioning system. Rather than generate heat energy, all heat pumps do is to take heat energy from one place and then shuffle it somewhere else with the aid of a closed loop refrigerant system that's filled with a gas that has a very low boiling point. At this point, I could go into the ins and outs of how heat pumps work, but I'm not going to do that because Alec over at Technology Connections made a really great video about it and I think you should watch it. And well, air conditioners are heat pumps or rather heat pumps operate like air conditioners, but in both directions. I'll leave the link in the description in case you want to watch his excellent primer. And you should subscribe to him because Technology Connections is great. Anyway, for the purpose of this video, I don't have to go super in depth with exactly how heat pumps work, but the important thing to know is that they are super energy efficient because instead of generating heat, they literally just move heat from one place to another. 
It's why more and more electric cars are switching from resistive and PTC heaters to heat pumps because while a resistive heating system will never give out more energy than the battery sends to it, heat pumps do. And that's not breaking the laws of physics, it's just taking heat energy from outside of the vehicle and pulling it inside the car. The energy you use when you turn on a heat pump is used to move heat energy. Nothing more, nothing less. But there's a problem with this wonderful system. The colder it gets outside, the harder it is to extract heat energy from outside and bring it into the vehicle. And it's one of the reasons given by automakers like GM for why its electric vehicles don't have heat pumps. I mean, when it's minus 40 outside, and yeah, that's the point at which Fahrenheit and Celsius actually agree on temperature, it's much harder for a heat pump, especially a small one like you'll have in a car, to move thermal energy quickly from one place to another. And that means your electric car takes a lot longer to heat up than it would at, say, around freezing point. Resistive heaters may consume a lot more energy, but when it's super, super cold outside, they're actually the smarter choice to heat an EV cabin. What does this have to do with Tesla? Well, it's conceivable that Tesla's heat pump is struggling to extract usable heat energy from the Quebecois air to heat the inside of the cabin. Or maybe it's a component failure or... Wait, I said I wasn't going to speculate, so let's just stop there. Suffice to say that I suspect Tesla is already working on a fix. Anyway, what this little exploration into different heating for EVs does tell us is that while resistive heating is quick and dirty and cheap for automakers, it's not energy efficient, so your range suffers in winter. But when it is super, super cold outside and you have a car with a heat pump system, your car may take a really long time to heat up or not even heat up properly. Is there a solution? Yeah, of course there is. There's, there's always a solution, but you won't like it. You see, electricity sucks when it comes to heating. And while there are new and exciting ways to keep your EV heated with zero emissions, like keeping the driver and passengers warm with heated seats, heated steering wheels, and targeted climate zones, liquid fueled heating is actually sometimes a better solution from an energy standpoint. It is, for example, why the Volvo C30 electric car I drove in the Arctic Circle nearly a decade ago had not one, not two, but three heaters. A PTC for the interior for short trips, an immersion heater that pulled power from the mains when the car was plugged in, and a biofuel heater that could come on in extreme temperatures and pulled fuel from a small biofuel tank. Systems like this do mean that you can keep your range in winter and keep warm, even when it's unbelievably cold outside. But adding double or triple heating systems expands cost and complexity, which isn't a good thing when building a car. Plus, of course, most EV owners, including me, would prefer not to burn anything to keep the cabin warm. That said, if you were interested in such a system, the lovely Gavin Kiwi EV Shoebridge actually installed a small biofuel burner in his Peugeot Ion EV when he was still living in Bratislava to help him keep range in the winter. I'll, I'll link to it there and below. The solution for the rest of us though, keeping our cars plugged in overnight and making use of either climate control timers to precondition our car in the morning or manually activating the car before we leave. That will help immensely regardless of whatever heating system your EV has because when you do that, you're using mains power, not battery pack power. And the basic laws of thermodynamics state that it takes less energy to keep things at a constant temperature than it does to warm or cool them. So if you've already heated up your car before you unplug it, well, happy days. And if you're really nerdy, well, you could maybe even tie your car into your home Internet of Things system. I've got our cars working with HomeKit, but that is for another video. So there you have it. Sure, I, I know it is summer now, but it's better to be prepared for the winter, right? I just hope I haven't made you too depressed and too cold thinking about what the weather's going to be like in six months. Anyway, that's it. Thanks for joining me. I'll see you next time.